Hey, welcome everyone uh, to this month's associates meeting at CEPR. I'm Mark Duggan, I'm the director of CEPR, and I'm really delighted to see all of you here today. Um, as most all of you know, these associates meetings are a really important way for us to bring together our supporters with policymakers and academics who are focused on the economic policy issues that we study and analyze here at CEPR. Uh, our speaker today is Fiona Scott Morton, who will be talking about whether rising markups of price over marginal cost in many parts of the economy are something that regulators should be worried about or not, and many other topics. Uh, I should note that Fiona is here visiting Stanford this week, uh, and she is also visiting jointly with the Corporations and Societies Initiative at the Graduate School of Business that is spearheaded by Anat Admati, who is our next associates meeting speaker in, uh, in just a few weeks. So we'll, you'll be hearing more about that, and we're very excited for that event as well. Uh, Fiona is the, uh, uh, and feel free to correct me if I get any of this wrong, but I think, I, I think I'm on the mark. Fiona is the, the Theodore Nirenberg Professor of Economics at Yale School of Management, where she has been on the faculty since 1999, almost 20 years. Uh, and she did her undergraduate work there as well and received her PhD at MIT soon after that. Her first job out of graduate school in 1994 was actually as an assistant professor at our very own graduate school of business. Uh, she then transitioned to the University of Chicago School, uh, Graduate School of Business before moving two years later, later to Yale. Uh, her area of research is empirical industrial organization with a focus on empirical studies of competition in areas such as pricing, entry, and product differentiation. I have known Fiona for many, many years. We have actually written three papers together about pharmaceutical pricing, and uh, all of that work was, was, was terrific, and it's ex very exciting for me to have her here today. She's a really uh, excellent example of an academic economist whose ideas are making their way into public policy debates. Her recent work on pharmaceutical prices uh, has been uh, in competition and regulation has been making its way around DC at agencies including the FDA, Department of Health and Human Services, and others. Uh, her published articles range widely across industries from magazines to shipping to pharmaceuticals to internet retailing, and she has published in many of the profession's very best economics journals. Uh, for 21 months from May 2011 to December 2012, Fiona served as the Deputy Assistant Attorney General for Economics at the Antitrust Division of, uh, of the US Department of Justice, where she helped enforce the nation's antitrust laws. She now teaches courses in the area of competitive strategy and served as the Yale School of Management's Associate Dean from 2007 to 2010, and twice won the school's uh, teaching award. Um, she served in lots of editing roles, won many prizes, and I could spend a lot of time talking about all of her accomplishments, but I know that all of you want to hear from Fiona and not me, so I will get off the stage and please join me in welcoming Fiona to CEPR. Thanks, Mark. That was really nice. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, wrote this talk for a heterogeneous audience, uh, so I'm hoping that uh, that, that works. And uh, you can ask questions uh, at the end, so if it, if it didn't, um, we can clarify anything that, that went by too fast. OK, um, this is um, a talk about markups. Um, it might you might have seen over the last couple of years something in one of the publications that you read about a competition problem in the United States and how, uh, and how there's declining competition. And that has actually stimulated a lot of people in industrial organization to, to ask what kind of evidence is there of that and, and, and how strong is that evidence? Where, would, where should we be looking? Um, the macro evidence on this topic has been accumulating, and I think the leading uh, paper here is by Jan de Locker and Jan Ekut, uh, who are both in Europe now. And they use a really long time series, 1950 to 2016, and they uh, use an, a method uh, invented by Bob Hall and, and modified uh, somewhat, but a production side method. And uh, Mark was af afraid because I have a Greek letter on this slide, but I, I think you can all. <laughs> I think you can all handle it. Um, this is the expression for markups, which I'm not going to say anything more about. And uh, if you have accounting data on, on fixed costs and on uh, variable costs, like, for instance, the wage bill or, or the materials uh, bill, 
then you can do some maneuvering around uh, these expressions and you can figure out uh, the markup, which is price over marginal cost. So what they uh, do in this paper is plot that markup from, for the United States from 1950 to 2016. And you can see that it, it grows rather substantially. So particularly since the 80s, it's moved from about 1.3 to about 1.6. This has stimulated some imitators and, and other people using European data and so on. The latest paper, uh, actually, which came out last week, is Bob's uh, own. He, uh, as I said, was the originator of the production side method. He used a slightly different methodology than uh, Jan and Jan, and he also finds growth in markups from the 80s to the present. Uh, so not as, not as large, but still a substantial uh, increase. Okay, so this is, I think, much better evidence than um, the evidence that says, you know, how many firms do we have in the consulting sector or how many firms do we have in the steel sector, which uh, inevitably is, is somewhat imprecise. So, so the markups, I think our, our interim conclusion is that, that we do have evidence of rising markups. Uh, furthermore, these, paper, these papers show it's driven by the top end of the, of, of the distribution and it seems slightly more prevalent in IT heavy industries and the results seem a little stronger in the U.S. than in Europe. Um, and the results are reasonably robust. Now, markups have a pejorative connotation in, in competition circles, okay, because this, you know, if, we th if things are going to be uh, perfectly competitive, then price ought to equal marginal costs and there ought not to be a markup. So let's think about whether we're worried about these rising markups as a, as a policy matter. Okay, what could be driving these rising markups? The first explanation would be an increase in fixed cost. So let's think about a perfectly, you know, zero profit world where more of the fraction of total cost is taken up by fixed costs. Okay, if I'm going to cover those fixed costs, my price has to cover those fixed costs, and therefore the price is going to be bigger than marginal cost, uh, I mean, compared to yesterday when I didn't have all those fixed costs. So we're going to assume that consumers, because we have a market economy, want the attributes uh, generated by these fixed costs. They want research into new treatments. They want invention of widgets. They want good websites and apps. And all of those have fixed costs uh, part of, uh, as part of them. So if we had a rise in that kind of product, we would see a trend in fixed costs across the whole economy and over a long period of time. And in equilibrium, we should have a price greater than marginal cost. Now, is that a welfare harm? Is that something we should be worried about? In a static model, those of you who have taken intro uh, micro, perhaps with Mark, uh, will know that, yes, I mean, um, uh, you know, price over marginal cost, it's monopoly pricing, we get some deadweight loss and so on. But in a dynamic model, you know, the firm can't run this business model and charge price equals marginal cost. There would be nothing there to pay the fixed costs and the firm would exit. Okay, so we couldn't have these businesses if we required price to equal marginal cost. And consumers are likely better off with the existence of these businesses um, at price above marginal cost. And suppose we took this dynamic view and said there's a zero profit constraint, then there's really, oh, there's a little typo, there, there's no, then there's, there's even less of a problem. So firms are making a gross margin on each, each unit because price is bigger than marginal cost, but they're using that to cover their fixed costs and they're not making any economic profit. And so we really would, would think of that as, as not being a problem. Now, that's a very toy arithmetic example. What if the flow of profit occurs differentially across years? What if there's some risk involved and some of these companies have a lot of profit and some of these companies have a little profit and so some of them make money and some of them lose money? It's going to be a little more complex when you actually get to doing the, the math, but, but we wouldn't really in general be worried about this kind of problem. Okay. The, however, a larger proportion of fixed costs out of total costs does have competition enforcement implications. What are those? Well, higher fixed costs means more concentrated markets. You can't fit as many firms into the market when there is a big fixed cost that needs to be paid. Okay, so you're going to have more concentrated markets. That means less competition in the market and more competition for the market. Okay, so that means the lot of the locus of competition is going to be around entry rather than what we do once we get into the market. So enforcers are going to need to put more weight on potential entry theories of harm, incipiency, you know, tomorrow this is going to happen, theories of harm. They're going to have to worry about small firms that might be disruptive, potential entrance from elsewhere in the vertical chain. Any kind of theory of harm that involves entry is going to have to be 
uh, more heavily weighted in a world where we care a lot about entry as being the way that firms are disciplined. Because once they're in the market, uh, it's a more concentrated market. Now, how to test for, now, is it really just fixed costs or do we have some profit on top of uh, these fixed costs that's, that are causing these rising markups? So there's a question about how you might test for zero economic profit. Jan and Jan uh, overlay their estimated markups on stock prices uh, in the United States, and they find that markups rise with stock prices. They find that markups rise with dividend payouts. So that evidence indicates that, in fact, there is economic profit. Right? There's no reason for the stock price to rise if we're in a zero profit world, and I just have more fixed costs. Okay? So... You could think about whether sample selection is an issue. The, this is an, a, a paper that focuses on firms that are listed on the stock market. Maybe those are extra successful firms and the failing firms are not on the stock market. So that's an interesting question. Um, note also that the fixed cost story really should hold across all countries, right? IT is happening, the computer got invented everywhere. And the evidence of rising markups is present in Europe, but it's weaker. Um, so it doesn't seem likely that fixed costs are the whole story. Okay, we're going to have to look a little further. So explanation number two that others have proposed and I know uh, very little about, really, is the globalization explanation. Falling tariffs, at least until next week, uh, and transport and contracting costs uh, might be you know, opening up markets. And if you operate in multiple countries, maybe you can have legal tax evasion and you can operate, you know, have a really optimized supply chain where you're picking the lowest uh, cost input from whatever country is, makes the most sense. And I can invest in a brand in the United States or in Europe where there are wealthy consumers and have this optimized supply chain and have really high markups in that world. So that would be an in consistent with an increase in markups for a subset of firms, but not for all firms. Okay, then there's the macro finance explanation, which is intangibles. We're missing some factor of production, and that we're going to call that intangible assets. Okay, so my first reaction to this is that's very convenient. When you can't measure something, okay, it can explain everything. Um, but, you know, the second reaction is it's quite plausible that there's some interaction between skills, intellectual property, firm capabilities like management, you know. So then there might be a return to that, and uh, that's one possibility. I'm going to just leave that. Um, what the macrofinance people, however, show is that the share in the national income accounts going to rents is rising. Okay, so what are these rents? The labor share is falling. The capital share is falling. The rents, the share of rents is what's left over. So what are those rents? I think that's the kind of, the la I'm going to divide rents into two groups, but that's the last uh, uh, area that's got real potential for being an explanation for the rise in markup. So there are a bunch of rents that create deadweight loss and bad incentives, and I think we have plenty of those in the United States right now. So we have excessive amounts of occupational licensing, the share of the labor force covered by occupational licensing is up to 30%. State legislatures get captured, and they protect, uh, you know, the dog massagers and the hair braiders and the flower decorators and the people like that, and with conditions that are really not related to consumer welfare. We have a lot of non-compete clauses, many, many non-compete clauses. Now, fast food franchisees use them with their workers. I mean, if you flip burgers at, at you know, McDonald's or Arby's, you might have one of these. It just seems really unnecessary. Um, we have a lot of patent trolls who are running around um, gathering up low-quality patents and, and using them to extort uh, rents from other firms. And we have lots of regulatory capture. So if you're the Department of Transportation, you're, you know, today issuing rules that let, uh, let, let airlines hide bag fees, for example, so that consumers can't figure out how much the bag is going to cost until after they bought the plane ticket. Or, you know, favorable regulations for cable or car dealerships, uh, you know, states uh, enacting favorable regulations for auto dealers in, inside their state. So these are, these are I think, um, these ha have grown in the last 30 years, and they're really uh, quite a substantial problem. We know how to solve them. But that's a political problem. That's not, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to avoid talking about it, but um, the, the solution is not something we need to do economic re research on. We need to figure out a political way to stop, uh, to stop this regulatory capture. However, uh, the thing that I really wanted to spend most time on in this talk is the rise in rents that are due to monopoly profits that are caused by lack of competition enforcement in the United States. 
Uh, the full effect of Chicago School of Thought uh, has really happened. We've had a 40-year trend toward less enforcement. And ironically, we now know, I think more than we ever did before, how badly wrong most of those ideas are, were, are, and still are. So ideas like monopoly is inherently transitory. Someone's always going to come along and disrupt the monopolist. That's just empirically not true. Okay? I mean, some monopolists get disrupted, but many others do not. Most mergers are fine. Vertical mergers are always fine. Most mergers are fine is a sentence without very much content, because what, why do people merge? Well, they're in a country with a set of laws, and they merge where they think they're going to be allowed to merge. So it wouldn't, shouldn't be a big surprise to discover that most mergers are lawful, because they've been chosen to be that way. So that saying most mergers are fine is different from saying if there was no merger control, what kind of mergers would we see? That's a different question. Oligopoly markets are contestable. Uh, prices will always equal marginal costs in an oligopoly market, or someone will come in and drive it down. Okay, that's Again, we have lots of literature uh, saying these things are not true. Coordinated effects uh, you know, is a large part of this uh, tradition that doesn't believe in coordinated effects, and a lot of the game theory showing we can have lots of interesting coordinated effects was done here at Stanford. So the, this, this tradition is, uh, is a little bit of a caricature of itself at this point because it's so far removed from the research in economics. And it may be that firms that have, that have been allowed to create and keep uh, market power could be the ones at the top of this markup distribution. Um, so, and this would also be uh, consistent with American markups being higher than other countries' markups because this whole Chicago school trend away from enforcement is a particularly American uh, tradition and it's not shared by uh, any other country that I know of. So specific areas to worry about in terms of uh, enforcement. Um, I put the dominant tech uh, firms at the top because that's a very short issue for me in this talk, which is uh, the, the literature really has not come out with theories of harm. There. So I'm going to skip past that quickly, but we can come back to it in Q&A. There's accumulating evidence of merger under enforcement. There's some work on remedies by John Quoka, but there's a number of papers that are coming out now that are about you know, small mergers that are under the threshold that can be shown to be anti-competitive, potential competition, mergers where drugs in the pipeline are shut down, um, some other uh, evidence along these lines. And then there's unilateral conduct cases that we could be bringing under current law, and we're not. So I would list uh, my favorites there, platform MFNs, uh, friend cases, loyalty rebates, horizontal shareholding, monopsony, and two-sided markets. And I'm going to talk about these. Again, the two-sided markets, uh, whether to bring that or not, is going to depend on what the Supreme Court says about American Express uh, next month. The Supreme Court might say helpful things about American, the American Express case and kind of set up the law to be um, useful, or it might not. So markets where we have some economic evidence that, and economic theory that we're under enforcing, and what could we be doing about that? Well, we could bring a case about, uh, against platform MFNs. These cases have occurred in Europe. They're when a hotel wants to list on, let's say, Expedia, and the contract with Expedia says, well, hotel, uh, if you're going to charge $100 on Expedia, contract with Expedia requires that you charge no less than $100 on your own website and no less than $100 on any competing online travel agent that might be a competitor to Expedia. So that Expedia, with its contract, ensures that its competitors cannot undercut it. Okay, That's a most favored nation clause. Those have been enforced in Europe and made uh, illegal. Uh, friend, an SSO friend case. An SSO is a standard setting organization. The standard setting organization gets together and decides what LTE is, and that necessarily gives market power to the, uh, the patent holders whose patents are necessary for LTE. Those patent holders sign something called FRAND, which means I will not exploit my market power generated by this uh, standard on LTE. And uh, what we have in the United States is uh, this, this creation of this monopoly, and then Friend evasion of various kinds. We do have uh, one case, so this has been uh, enforced also in Europe. We have the first case of this kind really in the United States that's, that's quite serious, which is the FTC uh, suing Qualcomm uh, for exclusionary conduct or, or surrounding this, this friend issue. 
Uh, loyalty rebates are um, something that we have not been very vigorous on but could be. This is when a dominant firm says, buy 80% of your needs from me and I will give you a big rebate. And you really want to buy 60% of your needs from the dominant firm because you'd like to spend the other 40% on the entrance product. But the dominant firm doesn't want you to buy the entrance product and so and you're stuck with buying from the incumbent for some reason because the incumbent sells some items that the entrant does not. So there's a share that you really have to buy from the, uh, from the incumbent and that power to take that share and uh, create a rebate over it uh, can allow the incumbent to essentially grab part of the contestable share for itself. So this is the Intel uh, rebate case and there's a number of others uh, in the literature. General search, uh, this is just Google. The FTC investigated Google and dropped the case. The Europeans kept going. Horizontal shareholding, this is when uh, the five biggest mutual funds are the five biggest shareholders in big banks, big airlines, beverages, you know, all other kinds of large stocks. And so then you have essentially common owners. Right? You have the same four owners own it being the biggest shareholders in product market competitors. So, so one, you know, Vanguard will own United and Delta and American and Southwest. And BlackRock will own United and Delta and American and Southwest. Right? So that creates, uh, that may create a competition problem and we're not doing anything about that or studying it. And we have a recent uh, rush of papers in the monopsony question. Is it the case that large employers in a narrow geography or skill category are driving wages down? are actually paying below competitive wages. There have been a number of economics papers uh, that have come out in the last year, actually, uh, exploring this issue and indicating that it may be a problem. And then we have exclusive contracts of the kind that um, Google, for example, has for its Android operating system that the Europeans have opened a case on and are concerned that that uh, prevents entry of rival apps, um, prevents uh, full-fledged competition in apps and prevents a competition in versions of, of Android. And again, that's a case that the Europeans have pursued and, and the United States has not. So there's a, there, this is a wide swath of the economy that, that we're covering here, and these are cases that other countries have moved forward on and, and we have not. So that's the, that's the graphic just to show you where we are situated among uh, you know, industrialized countries and our intellectual leadership, or lack thereof. Um, okay, so the dominant IT platforms I put into one line, search and Android, common ownership, the Europeans are actually researching that, and monopsony, I think their labor institutions are a little different from ours, so it might not be so much of a problem. Okay, the last thing, how many minutes left do I have? Mark? I'm good, okay. So one other thing that I think is super important and that there really isn't research on, and... Um, is I think a big contributor to rents, is what I'm gonna call institutional malfeasance. Okay, so what is institutional malfeasance? That's really well-educated MBAs who understand the difference between elastic demand and inelastic demand, and go out into the world and figure out where the inelastic demand is and hit it hard, okay? So what do I mean by that? Uh, I have a paper with Zach Cooper that talks about emergency department physicians who bill out of network. So it turns out that your hospital contracts with your insurer, call it Aetna, okay? But the ED doctors organize their contracts with insurers separately from the hospital. So you can go to a hospital that is in network with your insurer and be treated by a physician in the emergency department who is not in network with your insurer. And you're a like a sensible consumer, you try to go to the, cons the hospital that's in network, you're doing your best to follow the rules, you arrive there, and bam, you get treated by this physician who's out of network. Um, this happens occasionally with anesthesiologists and assistant surgeons and things like that. So why do we have this? There's a little bit, bit of it that's just frictions in contracting. You get 2 or 3% of, of, of uh, claims that have this out-of-network bill. But there are actually firms that specialize in doing this as their business strategy. So EM Care is an emergency department outsourcing firm. And they come to a hospital and they say, hospital, we will run your emergency room for you. You, uh, uh, you know, it'll be free. That's always a good clue. It'll be free to you, hospital. We'll take over and we'll absorb all the uninsured patients and so on and, and uh, take over your ED and you won't have any staffing hassles anymore. 
And what EM care then does is pull all the doctors out of all their contracts with the insurers, and they just bill out of network. Okay, and they bill about three or four times as much as, uh, as they did in network. And they go around the country doing this. There's a ton of it in Texas, uh, not so much in California, um, quite a bit in the middle of the country. And this is, this is the firm strategy. And that they have perfectly inelastic demand because you, there you are in the ED already. The insurer often ends up paying the bill. Um, so either the patient gets a balanced bill and that's really unpleasant, or the insurer ends up paying the bill and everybody's health care costs you know, are higher and premiums rise. What's another one? Uh, both dialysis providers and pharmaceutical manufacturers make donations to nonprofit entities to subsidize purchase of their own very expensive products. Okay, so pharmaceutical firms will donate money to a nonprofit. The nonprofit has, let's say, they have, let's say, a 20, the nonprofit's for a disease. The pharmaceutical company has a 25% share of that disease category. The, uh, they, they therefore have a 25% chance of the dollar being used on their product. The out-of-pocket payment for the consumer is very high, let's say $500, so they go to this foundation and get money to help pay for their thing. But the $500 of their out-of-pocket payment is only a small fraction of the cost of the drug. The drug is $5,000. So for a donation, tax-deductible donation of $500, the company makes $4,500 with a 25% chance. Okay? This is, turns out to be profitable. You can get a positive rate of return on your donation by doing this. And the dialysis example works similarly. Katya Syme and Mike Sinkinson and uh, some others have a paper about hedge funds that when they realized the FCC was going to hold this reverse auction, which is to buy a TV station airwaves and then sell them on to, that the TV stations would say, we're willing to sell our airwaves, and the mobile guys, Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile, would uh, bid in for those airwaves and get spectrum get back to themselves, uh, figured out that if you could buy multiple TV stations in one market, it's kind of like the Enron strategy in the California electricity, you could withhold one of those TV stations from the auction in such a way as to drive up the auction price so that you would earn more on the rest of your TV stations. So essentially the way the TV stations are, are set up, they interfere with each other. And so uh, some of these TV stations were particularly powerful in driving up price. The hedge funds bought those TV stations, withheld them from the auctions, and caused the price of the TV station, the remaining TV stations to be much higher than they otherwise would have. PBMs, uh, pharmacy benefit uh, manu uh, managers, um, you know, there's a, uh, uh, can work on behalf of the client by trying to get you onto the lowest cost product. But the other thing that could happen is, let's say, uh, the tablet is about to go generic, and the brand does a product hop. They release a capsule. And the capsule is 75 milligrams, and the tablet is 60 milligrams. So everyone has to get a new prescription. They move to the capsule. Six months later, the generic comes out, and the tablet price plummets, OK, because now it's generic. Does the PBM? move everybody back to the generic. They could do that, okay, and that would be the cost-saving thing to do. Or they could uh, turn to the capsule maker and say, well, I have a lot of power in this situation. I could keep everybody on the capsule, or I could make them go back to the doctor, get a prescription, move them back to the tablet, and save them a lot of money. And the capsule maker says, I will offer you a large rebate uh, to keep the capsule on the most favorable tier. Okay, and so then the PBM can make money off of the way it arranges these tiers and not moving people back to the cheapest drug. And then I just thought last week I threw another bullet point on this slide, which had not been there before, which was Facebook, uh, you know, let's just uh, use our data and take advantage of unsophisticated uh, consumers who don't realize that they're, you know, being sold to Russians. So this is, um, you know, this is just a list of things that are legal but are a demonstration uh, that once you're on the front page of the New York Times with this, it's a little embarrassing. So uh, in the case of the out-of-network billing, that was uh, Zach's and my paper actually did end up on the front page of the New York Times. And then MCARE, you know, a senator got interested, and MCARE had to go to Washington and explain itself. And, and uh, that it, their business model is no longer working so well because uh, of the increased scrutiny uh, on it. So that's why I call it 
institutional malfeasance. It's not, it's rent seeking. It's really aggressive rent seeking. And that's going to be a part of this rising markup. So, in conclusion, <laughs> this is all really depressing. Okay, we have rising markups, and the causes of rising markups are fixed costs, which we're not so worried about, but globalization, maybe intangibles, lack of competition enforcement, uh, you know, falling behind, I think, intellectually in the way we do competition enforcement in the United States, and lots of regulatory capture, and lots of institutional malfeasance. And, you know, if we want to have consumer welfare rise and have a happier population, I think we have to address those topics. There's lots to do. Economics has a lot of useful answers uh, for these questions. With those answers, I think we can make policy change that lowers harmful markups, leaves in place, of course, the good ones, and increase social welfare. So the difficulty here is not going to be the economics because these changes are going to reduce rents. Those markups, who do they go to? They go to the people who own shares. Who are those people? The top 1% of the economy. These are the people who run most things and are in the government and make decisions. And it's not, therefore, in their self-interest to be uh, aggressively doing things that reduce rents. So that's a political problem, and the political economy of this setting uh, is very important. I don't think achieving change is going to be very easy or very simple, but not because the economics uh, is hard. Um, having said that, I don't think the economics is hard, but I think that we have not, as a profession, maybe done as much as we could to make it more um, accessible, translatable, you know, front and center, easy to digest so that policymakers really um, don't have any choice but to look at it. You know, and, and, and try to learn from it. So I'm sorry to be depressing, but, uh, but anyway, that, that's, uh, that's uh, what I wanted to tell you. Great. So that was, uh, isn't that, it's wasn't so depressing. depressing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so I have just, you were at uh, DOJ in 2011 and 2012. Interesting time. Uh, to be there, lots happening, and there are some cases t today that are, I think, somewhat similar to some of the cases that were going on when you were there. So uh, I'm thinking in particular of a couple cases. So there's this uh, Sprint and T-Mobile right now that is, I think, being about is possible. That, that's possible. Announced. Yes. Announced. And then AT&T and Time Warner which is yeah. a vertical as opposed to a horizontal merger, and that litigation just finished. Now, while you were at DOJ, if, if I remember correctly, it was the sort of AT&T and T-Mobile uh, merger that ended up being blocked. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Um, just sort of what, I mean, obviously nothing confidential given we've got about 11 cameras, and uh, but, but uh, I'm joking, we've got one. But, uh, uh, but, uh, one's enough. Yeah, one, one, is, one is enough. <laughs> um, but talk a little bit about that process and, and, you know, and, and give us a bit of a lens into how it's working today. Yeah, I think, um, I think the government got out of practice enforcing the antitrust laws during the Bush administration. And uh, under Obama, things uh, ratcheted up quite, quite sharply. I'll, I'll tell you one vignette, apparently on the first day, I wasn't there on the first day, um, the Obama people came in. If you wanted to have a conference call in the antitrust division, you had to fax a request for your conference call with all the relevant numbers and people to the conference call department at least 24 hours in advance of the time you wanted to have the conference call. Okay, so imagine trying to run litigation in that kind of world. Okay, so a lot of house cleaning, you know, like really ordinary things that would not strike you as particularly relevant to antitrust enforcement had to happen. Uh, but those things happened. So then enforcement started uh, picking up again. And I think AT&T, T-Mobile was a great example of really straightforward and classic, not new, none of the stuff I talked about that's actually kind of tricky, um, but straightforward and classic um, antitrust enforcement, which is a well-known, so, so these two firms decide to merge, and the first question is, well, what's the relevant market? And the answer is mobile wireless, uh, you know, phone service. And the innovation in the complaint was there was a national market as well as local markets. Previously, there had always been local markets, but by this point, uh, carriers were advertising nationally and rolling out technology nationally and pricing nationally. 
So then you go to the FCC and you get market shares from the FCC, which, because this is a regulated industry, they have, and you think about diversion, who's substituting to what if you raise the price of T-Mobile, who, where will people go? And you calculate some you know, incentive to raise price from that, and, and uh, then you look at the documents inside the firms and you discover that they're responding to each other and, you know, uh, I think the complaint describes, uh, you know, T-Mobile speeds up its network and AT&T has an internal document. Oh, no, they're speeding up. We have to invest and speed up also. And so you have some evidence of, of competition on the sort of the investment in innovation and quality front. So that's all in the complaint. And, and so that investigation gets done by the division staff. Uh, there's 50, about 50 economists, many hundreds of lawyers. And... Um, a complaint gets written that sort of describes the harm that the government feels is going to occur from the merger. And of course, if the government investigation does not, de does not determine there's going to be harm or that there's a little harm but a lot of benefit, then the government won't challenge uh, that merger. So then I uh, file a complaint, and, and in the case of at and T-Mobile, the, the companies abandon the transaction. So, <clears throat> so at a high, high level, that was sort of a horizontal merger. But the one, another one of these cases that I mentioned is more of a vertical merger yep. where the two aren't necessarily directly competing. Yep. And can you talk a bit, I don't know if, if there were many of those cases like that during your time. I missed the DOJ. two tricky ones. Uh, so I arrived just after Google ITA and uh, uh, the ticket people, um, Ticketmaster and Live Nation. So those were not mine, let me quickly say, for the record. Um, but a vertical merger, you know, the, the AT&T um, has been talking a lot uh, in the press about how vertical mergers are always fine and we should never worry about vertical mergers and the government is way off base in bringing a case against a vertical merger. And the, the thing you have to remember is the way a vertical merger gets in trouble is when there's a horizontal element. Okay, So if it's really just you know, Stanford University deciding to integrate with a restaurant. Okay, there's plenty of universities and there's plenty of restaurants and we're not going to think that's a competitive problem. But what the government's theory of harm in this case is, well, I've got HBO and HBO is currently being sold to all distributors, the Comcast, Charter, DirecTV, Dish, Verizon, everybody's buying HBO. Now, if AT&T owns HBO, then AT&T is going to say to itself, hmm, if I raise the price of HBO by a little bit to dish, now I'm above the freestanding monopoly price and I'm going to lose some customers from HBO. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose some customers like maybe dish won't want to buy HBO anymore. But that's okay with me because I'm AT&T and I own DirecTV. And if dish doesn't buy HBO, then customers are going to leave dish and come to DirecTV. So that's the horizontal piece. I can use my vertical purchase of HBO to affect horizontal competition between DirecTV and Dish. Or in the case of AT&T's handset, you know, we're all going to be watching our videos on our handsets shortly, so um, you, know, you could advantage the AT&T handset over a Verizon contract or a Sprint or a T-Mobile contract. So that's the way in which the, the vertical becomes a problem. Right. <clears throat> and so one of the things that you mentioned uh, during the talk was this idea of the definition of the market. And so, um, you know, one of the examples that I cover in Ecom One when talking about this, this stuff is the uh, Staples and Office Depot merger that ended up sort of, and I think this was, this was not during your period, not, ha not going forward. And questions such as, well, is Amazon in the mix in this? You know, do we consider Amazon? Who, who are the other competitors? How often did you feel like the question of the definition of the market was the first order issue? Well, this is a, an old debate. The market definition used to be much more prominent in, the, in merger enforcement than it is today because I think the economists have maybe convinced most of the lawyers that what we really care about is competitive effects. Price increases, quality declines, less innovation, stuff like that. Um, and the market definition is, serves the purpose of illuminating those competitive effects. It's not interesting sort of in and of itself as a construct, and the horizontal merger guidelines explain that. So why do you care about the market definition? Well, you care because it illuminates what substitutes a consumer has. So if I can substitute to Amazon for office supplies, then it's in the market, and if I can't, then it doesn't belong in the market. And then if it's not in the market and I can't substitute to it, then the only remaining options are Staples and Office Depot, and then you can see that that would allow them to raise prices. Right. 
So I just have uh, one more question, then I want to open it up for questions from, from people here. So when, when you and I studied I.O. in the 90s, uh, there was you know, a lot of cases of sort of in this space, let's say airlines. Airlines, it's pretty clear what the market definition is, American, United, Delta, Southwest, and so forth. And you know, this is, the world is, was more complicated then, but it's arguably become even more complicated now. Um, and you could think about, well, if American United were to merge, what's going to be the increase in prices that might result, if any, uh, and so forth. Curious how a place like DOJ thinks about these companies that have sprouted up in the Bay Area in recent years. Down, you know, we've got some big ones here: Facebook, Google, and so forth. I'm just curious what, if if you have, and you sort of there was a bullet point, and you said there just hasn't been much in this space because of the theory of harm. Yeah. I'm curious to hear a bit more. You said it could come out in the Q and A. So yeah, I I mean this is a really interesting area. We have seen essentially no enforcement in the United States. Um, I think that could be an issue of political will. That could be an issue of confusion. That could be an issue. Of, you know, there's a there's a number of reasons um, that that could be happening. But certainly one that's very salient to me is, you know, when you're expecting the government to enforce you want it to be very clear what it is that the company is doing that is a violation of the antitrust law that's hurting the consumer. Okay? And you want to be able to explain that in the way that I just did about HBO and DISH. Okay? There, there should be a, like a, a, a reasonably clear way to articulate that. And we are not seeing, I'm not seeing, uh, that bubbling up from academia or policy uh, policy places. There, there's, there's some, I think, concern about these companies that is probably justified, and, 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 but the way it's manifesting itself right now is in more vague concerns, like they're big, or, or they're influencing our elections, right? That's, of course, completely fine concern, but it's not the antitrust one. But big is not what we get worried about in the United States. It's not a violation of the antitrust laws. We need a particular pattern of conduct that's harmful and that's causing uh, you know, a, a, a reduction in competition. So this is an area, I think, of that's going to be of great interest going forward. I would watch your newspaper. I mean, it seems like you can't open up uh, the news these days without reading something about competition and problems in competition and problems in tech. Um, so I think we'll be seeing action here, but I, I don't. I think that's really the problem. I think if you're an enforcer in the United States, you need that theory of harm uh, to be able to, to run with. And then there's a question of whether they want to uh, after, after the theory of harm is right. set up. Right, 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 okay. So with that, I'd uh, like to open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, any, here, here we go, uh, right here, Sam. Thank you. Uh, you talked about translating this into more you know, everyday terms being one big way to make an impact. Do you have plans or do you have suggestions for how that might happen? Um, well, yes. So for example, along with my friend and colleague, Doug Melamed here, um, we, a group of us have uh, wrote nine articles that are pretty short. I mean, they're law review articles, but they're pretty short and pretty accessible. And they're uh, an issue of the Yale Law Journal that's coming out this month that uh, lays out actually most of the, the cases that I just, uh, just listed up on the slide and explains the theory of harm and explains the economic evidence and how you could go about prosecuting those. So that's one way to do it. Um, I have some other projects underway that are less well formulated, so I'm not going to talk about them. But, but And events like this, for example, where, you know, this is being recorded. The slides are going to go up on a website. People can go and they can look at this and think about it and, and you know, ask their local friendly I.O. professor to come and explain it to them if they're confused. Um, but but uh, I think it is still something that academia doesn't reward very much. And, and so it's a little, you have to be a little more proactive to do it and to make people make your friends and colleagues do it too, because uh, it's not natural. You related to that. When you were at DOJ, how much did you feel like in these big decisions, the place that you went 
or one place that you went was academic research published in you know these journals that were that yeah so academic research is super important once the theory of harm is set because once everybody knows oh you know the health insurance uh, market works like this and uh, the elasticity of demand is going to cause people to do whatever then that elasticity of demand comes from some Stanford professor's publication so that's a very serious way in which academic research influences policy. But I think the theory of harm, it's like a story. It's like a theme. It has to be, you can't say it to somebody and have them understand it and be like, oh, I'll go write a complaint about that. No, they have to chew on it. They have to hear it more than once. They have to hear it from somebody else besides you. They have to sleep on it for six months. They have to go to a conference and meet somebody else who wants to talk about it. And then after all of that time, they might, they might get it. So that's the process that we need to go through as a, as a community. And is that why in the antitrust division at DOJ, you said there were about 50 economists, but many hundreds of lawyers? Exactly. Is that the, is that, is that the right ratio of <laughs> eight to one? I'm or? not going to answer <laughs> right, that question. Okay. <laughs> okay, here, we got a question right here. Uh, one thing I'd like to explore is the difference between national interest and antitrust. And what I'm thinking about in particular is if you look at uh, – large market cap companies that were formed since 1970. Uh, it's very high concentration of companies from the United States, in particular even on the West Coast, whereas Europe doesn't really have that many. And so one thing I look at as a really big difference is if I'm looking at Staples merging with Office Depot, that really doesn't affect U.S. competitiveness on the world stage. Okay. On the other hand, if I'm looking at Facebook, Google, Microsoft, et cetera, is it really that bad that we have an economy where U.S. companies dominate the global market and maybe to some extent, uh, you know, some economic advantages, you know, that otherwise might be attacked by antitrust may actually be in the U.S. interest. You have to ask yourself is, to what extent did Europe benefit by uh, the computer company Bull in France disappearing? Olivetti disappearing, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, ICL. I, I understand the what question. What extent does national interest I think, uh, so national, the short answer is it doesn't. Um, so the, if we follow the policy you have in mind, we would say, well, monopoly is really great as long as we're taking monopoly prices from other countries and the poor people in the United States, and we'll just give all those monopoly profits to the owner of the monopoly firm. And we will tell the people in the United States who are paying monopoly prices and are therefore more poor as a result, have less disposable income, that they're going to get it back in some way uh, from these large companies that are owned by, you know, because 80% of the stock in the United States is owned by the 10% wealthiest people. So most people don't own any stock. Um, so then you'd be in the... now. You could tell them that the government's going to redistribute it, but when you have a tax bill like the one we just passed that takes money from poor people and gives it to rich people, it's not really very plausible to say, oh, we're going to let the monopolist, we're going to redistribute the monopolist profits after he creates it. So I think the world you're talking about, first of all, the antitrust laws don't envision national interest at all. It's just not part of the law. And secondly, even if it were, it's grossly regressive. So you would have to be just in favor of, you know, taking all the surplus in the economy and giving it to the 1%. And if that's your objective function, it would work great. Um, but if it's not your objective function, then uh, it wouldn't. Right here. I want to uh, follow up on the AT&T Time Warner question. Um, so uh, the question is, if you look at it with a backward-facing lens, you could perhaps argue that this is anti-competitive and you could imagine the kind of behavior that you talked about. I think the argument AT&T makes is that's actually not what the future looks like for us. The future for us is we're going to be competing with Amazon, Netflix, Google, Facebook, Apple, and if we don't have a more vertically integrated strategy, we will not be competitive. Um, what do you think of that argument? So, I don't understand it because Google and Facebook and Amazon don't own any wires. I mean, what, what, think about AT&T. Ver, what vertical means is I own a satellite and wires and spectrum, mm -hmm. and I deliver this stuff. Yeah. Now I want to own the content that I deliver. These other companies you're talking about, they don't own wires and satellites and spectrum. They just own content. So right. they're, they're kind of symmetric to Time Warner. So Time right. Warner is, 
you know, could have an app and have people put the Time Warner app on their phone and then they would be just like Netflix. Right. I think so, so I don't understand why. I think why the argument is that the carrier business model is ultimately challenged and that you need to be in the position of providing services on top of the network. So what that to sounds to me like is owning the wires and the spectrum and the satellite isn't terribly profitable. Okay. Therefore, I'm going to get some content and I'm going to use that content to make my wire profitable. That sounds to me like raising prices. Raising prices. Yeah, more attractive business model, I think, is code for raising prices. I mean, unless... <laughs> well, but I mean, otherwise, you've got the wire and you've got HBO and it's the same thing I watched before. It's just now it's owned by the same corporation. So for it to be more attractive... I have to be leveraging. I, I don't think that's true. If you buy a business that has better long-term profit fundamentals and the profit don't turns are positive versus negative, of course you do. Okay, and they're paying so then for where's it. the surplus? A two plus two is four. I, I need it to be two plus two equals five. Where's the Where's the extra? But I don't think they, I don't think they're. You don't have to make the argument that there's a, that there's a synergy. You're just making an argument that it's better for us to be in that business. That is a better business long-term, that has better long-term fundamentals. Okay, so that's, that's a tried and true thing for a CEO to want to do, okay? I'm a CEO of Kodak. If chemical film's going out of business, so let me quickly buy, you know, NBC or something like that. And then, then I'm the CEO of a business that's still alive and vibrant and I can get invited to good conferences and Jackson Hole and stuff like that. So that I completely understand. That makes sense. I, you know, it's not especially useful for the consumer, but as long as those businesses aren't creating anti-competitive harm, that's, that's fine. Right, but here we have anti-competitive harm. That's the problem. So one right back here and then another right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, how do you view the uh, development of the usefulness of conduct remedies in industries like the ones we have up here that are rapidly evolving and view lots of disruption? Yeah, I think uh, conduct remedies have really are not popular with anybody. Um, they're not popular with, with conservative uh, antitrust scholars because those antitrust scholars would rather just let the merger happen. They're not popular with liberal antitrust scholars because those antitrust scholars think the remedies are ineffective and so you essentially just let the merger happen. Uh, and they're not popular with people in the middle who just think they're very costly to enforce. We have to keep, it's like you have to keep babysitting the industry and come back and see if they're following the rules and, and, uh, and it's, it's costly to enforce them and you're not very good at it and the industry moves on. So they cease being uh, very relevant. So they're really not popular. Why do we keep using them? <laughs> because, uh, you know, blocking something is a big cost and, and letting it through is a big cost. And now there are some kinds of conduct remedies that are much easier to um, use and, to, and have a more permanent effect. So, for example, I might be worried about intellectual property uh, being uh, combined in a merger and creating market power. I could require that the companies license those patents royalty-free or put them into the public domain. That, that's a conduct remedy in a way, but once you've done it, there's no babysitting needed. Those, those patents are just in, in the public domain. So there's a few things like that that I think are easier to enforce, but in general, it's not popular. Okay, two more questions, one here and then back. Sorry, I'll yeah. try to be quicker. Yeah. Uh, first, a, a short observation. It seems to me that a lot of the items you listed and the general theme reminds me of the kind of bureaucracy that we have in India. It's bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake without any prioritization. So to give a real example of what prioritization might bring us, I believe excess charges for drugs and medical services in this country amount to as much as 5% of GDP hundreds of trillions of dollars, yep. Yep. yet there is no priority in the antitrust division to work on these sorts of areas. Instead, yeah, we're so, talking about stopping the AT&T merger. So that's not quite true in the sense that when I was there, certainly the amount, the volume of commerce really mattered. Um, if there was harm in a really big industry, that was more important than harm in a small industry. But I agree with you that healthcare is tricky and healthcare is quite captured. There's a lot of elements of um, missing competition in healthcare that some of them could be handled with competition enforcement, but some of them are regulatory. 
where the regulations actually set it up so that firms are shielded from competition. And that's a big problem. Um, but that's not an antitrust problem. Final question right here. Uh, when new research comes out as to the welfare effects of particular legal practices or doctrines, how do folks at the antitrust agencies trade off responsiveness to that research with things like legal precedent or keeping like a consistent uh, enforcement regime? That's a really good question. Um, you don't quite exactly want to keep a consistent enforcement regime. I mean, you can get good at enforcing buggy whips, and you can be really consistent in buggy whips, and as, as the years go by, you know, the buggy whips are here and people are not buying them anymore. Um, so you, that, that, there's a limit to how much you want to be uh, focused on precedent. What makes these theories of harm difficult to enforce is that you have to do something new. And a new thing is a risky thing. There isn't a judge who's already issued a famous opinion saying you're right. There's nobody who's issued an opinion about that product because that product is brand new. So writing a complaint, assembling the evidence, litigating, trying to get the answer you want is much more risky when you're doing something new than when you're doing something old. And that means that it takes both political will and also skill on the part of the agencies at the same time to get that done. And I'll, I'll just call out Doug again here in the front row because he was part of the Microsoft case. And that's a nice example of something really brand new that was devised and carried out and successful and moved the law forward a lot. But we, we need a, a bunch more of that, I think. OK, with that, please join me. Thank you, Fiona Scott Moore. <laughs>